because there's only going to be a few of us, you know, it's going to be pretty embarrassing anyway, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> so come on in if you'd like to join in. And, you know, well, I don't know what's happening, Martin's going to explain it. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, Martin's a journalist, you know, he's a writer, he's a man of words, as you know. Um, whereas we artists, we just get tongue tied and lost. So I'll shut. Oh, we've you know, now in our line, our lineup of artists so far, we have Sir Stephen McDaniels. <laughs> Sir Stephen. Sorry, I'm taking over. Oh, <laughs> and Peter Hensley. How lovely! <laughs> where, where are the people that we actually want to speak to, though? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what we're we're trying. Oh, and Ebony Barclay. <laughs> And Nick Burns, also Sir Nicholas Burns of um, Lemmington. Here we go, look. There's more of them, look. Oh, there are more artists. Oh, there's more artists. He looks a bit apprehensive. Yeah, we've yeah, been thinking, well, what the hell have I let myself in for? I bought my coffee. I'm a mellow dude. I'll just sit here and drink it. I'll be fine. So this is cool. It's like we've yeah, we've really got the whole. Oh, and Jess Holland as well. <laughs> Jess Holland. I sit down. I stuck. Amazing. Yes, I think we'll need. I th I'll go around. I, I thought you know one or two of them would show up for this. So we put out being optimistic. You know, seven or eight chairs. But look at them all coming. Jamie. That's Jamie. Jamie Holman here, who's the main man with with a compost. What a very fine set. If you saw that. Wow. This is like um, it's like a talk show, isn't it? I'm going to stop talking <laughs> right now. Life. This is your so, life. Don't you need to join the line? Yeah. Oh, really? You, I'll, I'll join the end. You're of the not line. asking the questions, eh? No, I'm, I, in answering. fact, I'm going to shut up. I'm nothing to do with this. <laughs> Martin. You're answering the questions. Martin kills you, our yes. dear friend. Yes. Again. One of the questions we have is actually, you know, my understanding is, uh, you know, the, the 80s, when it started happening, you were part of a happening then. There was a scene going on, and uh, some of the memories that came in from the, the gardens involved playing at Stonehenge and the Marquis era. Now, what do you remember of that? Please say something. <laughs> I was going to say hardly anything, particularly, <laughs> particularly Stonehenge. You know what they say, if you can remember anything, you weren't there. Yeah. Um, and that holds pretty true. Uh, what can I remember about the marquee? Was that the question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, those, those early days of Solstice did, the marquee played a huge part of that. And I mean, there's people here. Debbie, John, who was there? and others. Hands yeah. up, who was there? Wow, brilliant. Check it out. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can answer the question then. Um, what do I, I mean, obviously, there was a fantastic community yeah. spirit going on, with not just with us, but with you know, the other bands, Pendragon, IQ, Liaison. Who else do we remember from Twelfth Night? Anyone else? Palace, yeah. Trilogy, Trilogy are, are up and going to do some gigs next year, actually. So Trilogy are coming back and doing some gigs. Hayes have never really stopped. In fact, I hadn't seen um, Chris and Paul from Hayes since those days, and we've done two gigs with them this year. <laughs> you know, sort of a 40-year break. Um, so I suppose that's the strongest feeling one gets is that kind of community that evolved around those bands that were playing at that time um, and the marquee I suppose was the home of that I know. mean I think that's quite an interesting concept that what's clearly happening with Solstice and myself and the other artists surrounding it is there's, a, there's another wee movement developing here a group of people who share some kind of s s similar concept and has that happened before you know you had the marquee vibe and now you've got this vibe has it happened in between times no no oh, so that, that's the incredible thing about it is this sense of of yeah community that's involved again that's evolved again and also you know that feeling of ambition you know not to make money because that's never going to happen obviously but amb ambition about the music and where it can go uh, and play it with this lineup um, it's, uh, it, you know, for, for, my, for my 
point, my, this point in my life, it is just so precious. It's incredible. Uh, I never imagined it happening. And suddenly, here, here we all are talking about it. And um, it's, it's just, yeah, I have no words for it, really. It's extraordinary. The specific memories of the marquee um, that uh, you guys probably didn't get into the dressing room. <laughs> but the, the way it worked was there was, I mean, it was a pretty small, sweaty black space. It just had an incredible feeling about it. And in the middle of the stage at the back was a black door. Obviously, everything was black. And you walked through the door and there was a tiny little hallway with a bench around it. And that was the dressing room. So, you know, one of, you know, one of the strongest memories is actually, in fact, it's, oh, there's a picture of it on the back of Silent Dance, the first album that we did. And uh, to be honest and open with you, my strongest memory is sitting in there with other musicians, friends that had managed to get in, getting high, you know? That's which is why you don't remember it. Which is why I don't remember it, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Well, um, I, I've been encouraged to ask the next question because uh, we should move on from this far past. But I have been instructed to ask you what you can say about working with Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull without getting arrested. Who well, asked that question? Do we know? Yeah, but I'm not telling you. Oh, you're not telling me. OK. <laughs> <sighs> I could talk for a long time about um, working with Tull because that was it was quite an experience. It was... Um, I don't know, there wasn't, to, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I mean, I love, I, you know, a precursor is that I love Ian and that band, and I saw, because I was doing front of house sound for them, I saw them about 120 times, and I loved every single one of them, you know. But I have to say, there wasn't a lot of laughter on any of those tours, <laughs> you know. I mean, it was a good experience, but there wasn't a lot of laughter. And I, and I think the biggest laugh that I got, actually, was when we, we because we had Clive Bunker playing drums, and I was working with Ian, and we kind of had an in, we were playing a lot of the Jethro Tull conventions, you know. And uh, I said to Ian, oh, yeah, we were playing one in Gravesend. I said, Ian, do yeah, you fancy getting up and playing with us? <laughs> Not thinking for a moment that he would. And uh, he said, yeah, sure. And typical Ian, I sort of gave him a part. And typical Ian, this is what he's like. I mean, I'm not kidding. 45 minutes before we played, he's in his dressing room practicing do 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 on the flute. You know, I mean, he is committed, man. He is totally committed to his art and what he's doing and takes it very, very seriously. But... The rest of the band weren't necessarily quite in on the fact that this was going to happen. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we're playing this song called Circles from Circles. I think it's called Circles from Circles. And Jenny's like, who the fuck is this old guy? <laughs> um, and why is he playing my part? <laughs> <laughs> So that made me laugh. And, uh, What's your version? No, you should not. That's, that's, you've got it right. I wouldn't have told anyone that. <laughs> so, listen, we have to move forward, I think. Um, you guys are all making music. Some of you guys have been make, making music for far longer than I've been alive. <laughs> but um, things have changed significantly in the last 20, 15, 10 years. How is it trying to create and develop music now? It's difficult. Well, it depends what aspects you're talking about. I mean, in terms of... of you know, recording music, you know, back in the day, we'd have to raise a lot of money for a start to get into a studio and we'd have to, you know, hit it in a day, get the job done, you know, get out. And so now, I mean, with Solstice, we've all got, you know, our own little, you know, our own laptop and, and microphone. And so in terms of recording stuff, I mean, that's, uh, it's prone to taking a very long time because we kind of can take a long time about it. Yeah. So that's a big change. I mean, we're fortunate in that a lot of our audience um, are prepared to, to buy a CD, you know, yeah. or a shirt or something. For, for my son's band, you know, Taurus and that generation, and maybe Jamie's got something to say about this. Oh, yeah. Hello, Taurus. <laughs> you know, their, their audience um, expect their music for free. So that... That makes it, in, or, or they expect dad to pay the you know, monthly premium thing. Still free know. to them, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so those things have, have changed a lot and have made it really incredibly difficult, I think, for young musicians to, I mean, uh, even for us, we rely, 
we rely completely on our guardians and thank you so much because I know there's a bunch of you here that help us um, do what we're doing. We, we just simply couldn't do what we're doing at this level without some financing and of course financing from record companies just isn't a thing. Um, so these beautiful people who, you know, or buy a CD or subscribe to what we're doing are making that possible. And that's just the model that we have to, um, Ebony will back me up on this. And well, that's, what, that's what I was going to say. I was hoping to bring... So actually, why don't I shut up? Yeah, good idea. Get the mic off him. <laughs> no, I was going to bring Ebony and Nick in at this point because a lot of the stuff that you guys do... It, you know, it's very technically involved, isn't it? And you couldn't have done it maybe 15, 20 years ago. You would have done something, but maybe not this. So is it easier to achieve your artistic ambitions? Yeah, I think, I mean, do you mean our music videos and that kind of thing? Or? Well, well, everything, everything, really. Yeah, um, I mean, it's very helpful that I married a producer, so... <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> you've always got to have goals. Um, but... <laughs> But we are able to produce music at home, which is amazing, and um, make it the way that we want it to be. Um, and when I made music videos two years ago during lockdown, we were able to do everything on a green screen and then send it to my friend in Australia who am animated us in space and things. So there's some amazing stuff going on there, but I think the, the thing that we've found that's, that's difficult is... I guess um, it feels like everything's very numbers oriented and you have to have the right numbers, the right amount of followers, the right amount of Spotify streams to get taken seriously. But a lot of the time those numbers don't actually mean anything and they certainly don't mean that you're being um, paid for your music. Uh, and so we have sort of gone... Um, away from trying to get a record deal or anything. Not that, not that anyone offered, but... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and we've, we've had to go with Patreon, which is a similar um, thing that Andy's done, and have a community around us that support us. And that has meant that we're able to release an album, we're able to work. Um, and, and I think one of the things, you know, working creatively is that you need time. You need time to have ideas and to bring them to fruition and if you're working sort of seven jobs and trying to make that happen it can be really difficult um so yeah that's one thing that that I noticed helped me was just having a bit more time and knowing that whatever happens I've I've got something coming in so I can pay other artists too you know pay animators and um and cellists and filmmakers and yeah other people to work with us um because I feel, you know, maybe if I'd started this, because I started in musical theatre and acting, um, and maybe if I'd started this when I was much younger, then I'd probably have a whole group of other people who were all experimenting together and we could do a lot of stuff for free. But now I just feel like anyone I know who's still working in this, these industries are doing it because that's their job and I want to make sure that I can also, you know, contribute to them too. So um, it's a really long answer. <laughs> I was actually intrigued by what you were saying on stage, Pete, about you know, that electronic machine that gives you the option to have two drums and one... one th uh, so what I was interested in was, does that affect your artistic vision? Or the, uh, w would the past... You, you might have pursued a different artistic vision if that facility wasn't available to you. Does the technology help? Does it, does it assist? Is it a partner or is it, a, you know, sometimes an enemy? It just means... I bring one drum out instead of two. <laughs> so let's um, bring it up, I think, to Shia. I mean, I think the reason most of us are here uh, is because Shia brought Solstice into like, a regeneration, if you like. And uh, I'm interested to see what everybody thinks you know, in the band and out of the band. So, Steve, you've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the, you know, coming into Sources, what was that like? And then the Shia experience? Well, the thing is, I came into Solstice quite late, really. All that stuff about, you know, um, Stonehenge and all that kind of getting high in the... <laughs> nothing, that didn't happen to me at all. I mean, actually, I was a fan of Solstice uh, at that age, but I didn't think I'd ever be part of it, you know. But, yeah, so I'm quite, uh, quite a newcomer. I mean, joined in 1995. <laughs> 
I don't think Jess was actually... You weren't born then, were you? Okay. How born? (laughs) 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 But that was with Jenny, came in at that time, and Rob came in at that time. Um, And then it died. We did some great gigs, and it was actually... That's right, we did those... um, in particular, those uh, Death Hotel conventions, which were brilliant. Uh, and then, then Solstice died again. <laughs> and then a bit later on, I think it's 2006, so yeah. that, yep, suddenly get a call from Andy, which fancy doing it again. And so we all... Well, that was Pete. Yeah, and that's when Pete started. No, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that happened because Pete said, you should get out go in again, man. I'll play drums for you. <laughs> that is literally where it started. <laughs> Uh, do, do you regret it, Pete? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, but, but, you know, and it was great getting back together, fantastic thing. And we, when we, we were going along and there were sort of these odd gigs from time to time. And there'd be a little, every year there'd be a little um, a renewal of Solstice, isn't there? And then suddenly, t- 2020 happened, Jess happened. And the thing's gone wild. It's absolutely, it's taken up all my time. <laughs> Good dear it. Everything else had to go. <laughs> That's why I haven't seen you in that pub we were talking about. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Jess, can I ask you? Um, I think I saw your first show with Solstice and then I saw your third and fourth. And, you know, it's been a, a blossoming experience for everybody. But... You know, how do you feel it's changed you as an artist and you as a performer in the last, what, 18 months, two years? Um, I would say I've become more confident. I think I remember my our first gig. I didn't really know the band because we didn't actually, I didn't, when we recorded, I hadn't met Steve, Pete and Rob. They were just... MIDI files on a, a and and audio tracks on a on a logic you know and so I got to know them through the music but our first gig I remember just standing behind my uh mic stand and going okay I'm just gonna sing I didn't really move and now if anyone's seen any more recent gigs I mean this stage is quite small so we'll see how I do but now I'm I'm bouncing all over and I think because how Andy writes and then how everyone has responded when we recorded Sheer and when we recorded Light Up as well, you can feel it. You can feel this energy that we pour ourselves into with the music and how I respond is just allowing myself to feel everything that everyone else is feeling and it just... Is, it's just a moment that I hope that you know we're all going to experience, and hopefully these benches will go away when we're performing. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> I think it, the the band has just changed who I am and how I respond to everything. There's just a, a love and a kind of passion. That I wasn't when Andy first told me about Solstice, I was like, "Cool man, you're in a band, whatever." <laughs> and I, you know, because we met through folk camps, and then uh, that's when I'd met Jenny as well. And their CDs were on on the tables. It was like, "Go oh, buy the CDs." But actually, Jenny's album is the one that I was like, "Whoa, wow, photo player." <laughs> um, but it was only because Andy had messaged me just before 2020 in 2019 where I'd come up to Milton Keynes to record one track, two tracks, Cheyenne, like how you actually wanted it to be. And I was like, this is, this is cool. I want to be part of this. And that, I kind of, that was the, the ceiling of the, I want to be part of this band now. I, I get what the message is that this band is wanting to share with the world. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's completely changed me of who I cool. am. Very cool. It's been a big part of my life as well for the last couple of years, as you guys know. But I mean, the word the word joyful always springs to mind when I think of solstice. Not not just joy, but joyful. You know, and that, that's a more 
joy is almost a static emotion, whereas joy full has a movement about it, and this is a movement. It just feels so so powerful. It's everyone in the room understands, don't you? But Jenny, can I ask your perspective? Because you've seen kind of both sides, kind of what the quieter moments in this this real move towards a, a massive peak, and it's only going to get better once the light up is out. What, what's your perspective of having seen the the ups and downs? I mean, it was at the time at what you're calling the downs were great. You know, and it was fantastic, and it was, it was, it was one of the things that that I was doing. Whereas now, this has become everything. Well, certainly everything for Andy. Um, it, it's it's all consuming. It's a passion, and it, it's fantastic. And 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 I think we're all so much closer as a band, personally and musically, than than we ever were. And um, and we all love each other, don't we? You know, he doesn't do the hoovering. <laughs> well, we need to talk about Light Up now. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to hear all of it multiple times. I've hit, you've sent me some sections when they were still in progress. And it's been interesting for me to go, like, you know, thinking, like, that's enough, don't touch it. And then, oh, God, you've added something that just added this little bit more. And you seem to, you know, we're surprised, but I didn't think you had it in you, but you have the ability to know when to leave it the fuck alone, when it's done, which is... That's that's a hard acquired skill, I believe. But what I'm interested in from everybody at this point is, at what point over the last year or so, you know, after Shia and while Light Up was in progress and the festivals, at what point did each of you think, you know, this this is really good. This is, you don't have to just say it's good. It just really is. Was it, you know, on stage? Was it during the recording of a particular track? Just one moment, you're like, you know, you don't have to talk it up anymore because it really is what it should be. Actually, I've got a moment. It's it's, <clears throat> and you're going to hate me for this, but it's when <laughs> actually listening to it to Sheer, the first track on Sheer, which is Shout on Spotify, and that introduction, that beginning, and then and opening the front door, and I think, wow, this is really good, and it feels like a new beginning. Yeah. Do you have a one-word answer? No. <laughs> Do you? Do you have a multiple word answer? Um, well, maybe uh, some of the gigs we've done this this summer have been really magical, and we've just had a great time, and we've played well. And even when we've come off and think we haven't played well, we watch it back, and actually, you know, we did good. Um, and uh, we did a gig in Italy this summer, and I mean that was that was such fun and they looked after us so well and we just had a ball you know I mean I think for me that was a, a special solstice moment uh, and I had a drum roadie too so I mean that's you know I didn't have to pack any drums up that was a special moment <laughs> Rob uh, wow I think there's been so many kind of special moments like that along the way and the one that sticks most in my memory is coming out of lockdown when we did a load of rehearsals at the Crawford and uh, and like the secret gig and just the energy of that was uh, was massive and kind of still gives me goosebumps to think about it and I think since then it's just continued to get more joyful and uh, and and get better and better uh, there was one particular moment I think that I will remember for the rest of my life because I've never, I don't really cry to music you know, and one song run, I just got back and we'd just done the vocal takes and Andy had then mixed it and sent it to me and the first time hearing that track uh, I had to sit on the sofa and then just cried for about half an hour after I heard it. Um, I think all of the tracks are written beautifully, but that particular one, as well as Bulbul, uh, I've never wept after hearing a song like, for, like that before. So I think it holds a very, like, really dear place in my heart from Andy's writing. And then when everyone else started adding their instruments as well, I was like, oh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a lot. I just, I, I'm trying to think. Bulbul. It was when I was actually trying to put some parts down to Bulbul and I was listening to what was 
what I was having to work to. And I suddenly realised, God, this is just an absolute masterpiece. And with shivers running down my spine, I think that was the time, I think the light up really hit me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, have you heard the album, mate? No, he hasn't heard it. I don't know. There's there's so many for me. To be, you know, as Jenny says, I'm, uh, and without Jenny's support, I couldn't do this. I'm just completely, totally immersed in the band and and trying to make it happen. And you know, record music and write music and communicate with people and set up gigs and make this sort of thing happen. And it's just. A f I mean, I do I do have a job because I have to earn some money. You know what I'm saying? But. Uh, every moment really and my family you know I've got three kids you know I hardly ever see them you know it's 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 I've, it's shocking actually when I say that out loud but you know we do we do manage to eat together don't we but my life no she's not buying it <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is what it takes you know for any band um, to, to to thrive is that someone has to be you know, this, the kind of driving force and that is just going to get, hand their life over to the project, you know. I mean, you know this, man, how, how much it takes to create something. Ebony and Nick know this. Well, exactly. You know. Um, I mean, what I had to do, you know, I had to, you know, leave my previous career, like working in media, working TV, radio and all that kind of stuff, just walk out of the city by the narrow boat and just calm the hell down um, so that there was time to be aware of the influence, the inspiration and the art. Time to express the ideas. You were saying that earlier, but it needs time. You know, you come up with a line of a, a phrase like, you know, that one we've written together, um, Waves and Nightingales. And that happened because I misheard somebody talking about the lines of Long Leet Zoo. And I thought they said the lines of longing. And I thought, lines of longing? I wonder what that means. And it sat in my mind for three or four weeks until I connected it to your music. And then you get nightingales and lions, so you've got an angry animal and you've got a soft animal. So there's, there's something changing there. There's something, uh, you know, angry to soft, you know, calming down. And that reflected my experience of leaving so much stress behind. And I've seen so many people who buy an arrow boat and take all the stress with them. You know, they get as angry about the rain as they used to do about losing a hundred thousand pound client. Right. And they're doing it wrong. You know, that's not yeah. the point. You're at yeah. three miles an hour, calm down, that's what it's for. <laughs> so you had these, the lions and the nightingales and you have this, the, the end of a war, which was kind of very real to me. But I could never, it would never have occurred to me if I was still working in media full time. Yeah, yeah. And you created the I would space never have had, had the time, creating the space, I would never have had the time to do it. Yeah. So, I mean, that yeah. must be, I mean, I think that's it's, a challenge for everyone, isn't it? It's really tough, isn't it? You know, because, I mean, I still work, I don't know, three or four days a week for money, you know. And, um, you know, to try and uh, write, record, do a, Yeah, it's, it just requires total tunnel vision, really, and commitment, right? You know, and, and like Ebony's saying, what her... Patreons do is just uh, you know is allow a little bit of space to do that, and it's the same for you guys as supporting us. Um, and also, you know, we as artists and musicians, we want to we want to respect each other and we want to pay each other. So, so whenever we do anything, um, it costs way more than you could ever hope to make from the event. You know, so this, you know, I, I just saying again how crucial you guys are your support to us whether it is actually kind of being a guardian or patreon or buying a cd or buying a t-shirt you know or coming to the gig and buying a ticket you know you good people i mean we are nothing for a start without an audience because it's a share you know obviously it's a two-way thing it's a shared street the music wouldn't the poetry none of it would exist without someone to listen and to interact with but um, so, yeah, we are, we are all so grateful that you're here, you know, from the bottom of our hearts, man, you know, because we couldn't do this thing that we love doing so much without Guys, you. Guys, can we give our audience a round of applause? Yes, please. You know, really, thank you so much. Yeah, because for us, it's a, it's a longing and it's a, it's a, a drive and it's, a, it's something that we have to do. And, you know, when we can actually do it and actually share it with people uh, and have an environment like this together, it's, uh, it's, it's what we live for. That's what we're here for. So thank you all. 
Does anybody out there have any questions we could answer for you? It amazes me that obviously you're all inspired by different things and you've been talking about the creative process. Yep. But I'd like to know, is there a point where you know you've got a really good subject for a song? Um, I don't know, like Ebony for instance. I mean, the first time I saw you, I didn't know, any, I didn't know anything about you. And the first time you got up and you sang about a whale and I just thought, you know, and I was blown away by the fact that you take an idea that maybe some people would just like pass it over and it becomes this thing. The question when, is, when do you know you've, you've got that subject and it's going to be great or you've just, you just got to let it go and it's just a, it's a false? That's going to be my first song again tonight, FYI. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, for me, I think sometimes I just, it's, I feel like they're epiphanies and I just have a like, oh, the whale is an intergalactic traveller. Okay. Um, but I write a lot of poems and sometimes I'll have some lines in my head I've got some at the moment for about six months and I don't know what to do next, but I know they're going to be something really special. Um, I just haven't worked out what the rest of it is. Um, so, yeah, I, maybe it's all like it's kind of a bit of an obsession um, and you feel like you've got to get it out, I guess. I think that's, yeah, and sometimes you feel like, yeah, it's like you've hit the sweet spot or something and other times you think, nah, that doesn't really feel like me. I, I don't think I ever actually know um, ever until even if it's finished if it's been worth doing it <laughs> but but um, I think it's just like the process of doing it which I enjoy which is what the name the name that George came up with is compost oh, it's, right, I get, yeah. Yeah, cool yeah, yeah. I get it it's just always changing and, and decaying Second. and then it becomes something yeah. useful I just thought you liked gardening <laughs> <laughs> no 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 our, our housemate likes gardening a lot <laughs> but but we just kind of appreciate it from a distance. <laughs> yeah. My process is, um, you know, I love working with words. Obviously, it's where I started. Um, but something comes to me and it just washes around in my head. And sooner or later, it starts formulating into something. And it's a character. It's never me. These things are always based on me, but none of them are me. First, I need something that somebody needs to say, and then I need to work out who's saying it. And then I need how it finishes, and then it all falls into place. But it falls into place very suddenly after maybe weeks or months. And it's almost like if you wake up in the middle of the night and you know you're going to throw up. <laughs> it's a bit like kind of, now, sit down to the laptop, now, get this written down, now. And sometimes the whole thing, you know, like a whole 16 verse piece can come out in the course of 45 minutes, and sometimes it fights you. But when I know who's talking and where they end up after having said it, then I know it's something worth developing. Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> who, uh, yeah, t I, we, we finished recording something like the album, and I think I just honestly think, where the hell did that come from, man? <laughs> you know, I do. Do you get that? I mean, you know, so there's no, there's no, never for me anyway. There's never any kind of plan or structure to, and it doesn't work like you describe. You know, that you have something floating around and then the penny drops or whatever. You know, um, for me, it's I normally hear something, and it inspires me, and I feel really feel something from it, and it moves me to want to try and create that same feeling, uh, and then. I, I do a lot of guitar teaching, so uh, the thing with guitar teaching in schools is you, you do 20 minute lessons, you know, for hours on end. And um, some of the students come in, they just want to chat, you know, that's quite, quite often happens. Sometimes they want to actually play some guitar, most of them never do any in between. But quite often they don't show up, you know, so when they don't show up, uh, I just sit there playing a guitar. And that's another. Some, something some, sometimes just, wow, what's that, man? You know, that's nice. Record it on the phone. And then when I get some time in the studio, I revisit all these little snippets that came from who knows where. And, and sometimes they turn into something and, and sometimes they don't. But normally, you know, I can, th I can track specific songs to specific things quite often that, that I've heard. It's just we're talking very often about a tiny little short moment in you know sound chaser by yeah yes you know relay that just made me go oh, man i want to do that i want to be the person that knows how it feels to create that to create that kind of vibe but then 
something like uh, Bulbul, which is the closing track off the album, um, completely out of the blue, Pete gave me that Bulbul sarang. Hey, this is for your 60th birthday, man. You know, I mean, I was like, my jaw was on the floor. And I just started noodling with it, and that was, that was it. That's where the song came from. So it actually came from a really good place as well. So Pete is responsible for A, us being here at all, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and for that piece of music. I'm a big fan of Charles Dickens, kind of one of my heroes. And uh, in his career, when he was writing all these great novels, they were actually uh, written as episodes for a newspaper. And he had to deliver 2,000 words every Wednesday, every second Wednesday. And I swear to you, he wrote them all on the Tuesday night. I'm absolutely certain of it. And that kind of hack attitude, because I used to work in newspapers, I have to create deadlines for myself as well. Do you find it's easier to work if you've got a deadline? Or I think can you complete a piece of art to a deadline? I, I think... Um you kind of a deadline makes you really it makes you let go of something in yeah. a way that a lot of us need yeah. otherwise you'll never finish it because to be honest yeah you never are satisfied completely satisfied with yeah with a piece or with the recording or the mix you can always go back and maybe you make it better maybe you make it worse but at some point you've got to let it go so for me a deadline is you know is that moment you have to release it. Yeah. And so the, we, I need that. It's like that old saying, you know, a, a work of art is never completed, it's just abandoned. And there exactly. Is a, but but yeah. the, <laughs> exactly the, right. the advantage of that, though, of course, is the, the, certainly the way I see it, you have to finish something in order to look back in it and see what you've learned, see what you did better than the previous piece. So, you know, that desire you've got to keep tinkering, you can actually move that into the next piece. And I find that quite a healthy way yeah. to approach it. Creating Shear and, and having Jess's input into that and having this new lineup and realising that man, we've got something really happening here um, was the inspiration for Light Up. It was just a continuation of that same energy that we managed to produce on that album. And I'm already feeling the completion of the Sheer trilogy. There's another album that's going, come on, get on with it, man, get on with it, man. <laughs> you know, so this, this has been unbelievable for, since 2020, this kind of creative energy that we're all absorbed by and infected with. And um, <clears throat> it's an uh, extraordinary time. You know. So just to wrap up, because I think we've overrun, as I always knew we would. Um, yes, sir. What are your plans for the coming year with the release of Light Up and with you know, live shows? Not more festivals, more. Anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a little scared. A scared. Someone asked about what are your fears, you know, and my fears are: can we continue doing what's happened this summer? We've had this run of festivals from Glastonbury, you know, to to uh, Veruno and, and now here, you know, and we've got one more this year and it's just been extraordinary. As Pete said, we've done some gigs that have been, had just some beautiful moments in them and we've really connected with a lot of people, a lot of people that haven't heard the band before, which is really exciting. And so my fear is that we're not going to be able to continue that that path you know so i'm furiously kind of c contacting festivals and hustling people you know which is kind of what it takes but as i said the third album is already you know it's in, in my imagination do you know what it's called yeah. yet? no i was thinking about that this morning you got, got an idea no oh come on no because i thought about it it I doesn't thought, matter if it changes the thing it's, just, is, it's it, like it, with people shit, would like to know the lines along which you're thinking yeah but, but Shia and Light Up, those, album, those titles suggested themselves during the process of right, making it. Yeah. And so I thought, yeah, it would be cool to have a title. You're right, but I don't. And the title will, will emerge and announce itself while we're recording it. Every time and the guys are thinking, Steve's thinking, oh, for fuck's sake, man, I just need a break. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I just need a break. I've just finished one album, you know. And like, and what people don't probably realise, you know, is that the amount of work these guys do um, to, to produce an album is phenomenal. I mean, Pete, because uh, me and Pete sometimes teach in the same schools, you know. So I hear him, you know, rehearsing, like working on this new groove that we're going to use, hopefully, you know. And it's a lot of preparation, a lot of thought, a lot of 
creative. It takes a long time. Um, and Steve's like, you know, really, man? Are you going to send me another fucking piece of music now? <laughs> you know, I've got to come up with some more ideas. You know, I've got to... <laughs> so anyway, it's all good. It's all good. Excellent. I was going to say, if we'd had enough time, we could have taken suggestions for the next album name from the crowd and got you into some right bother. But um, <laughs> we've rambled on as I feared we would. Thank you, everybody, for taking part. Enjoy the rest of the day.